up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the VFR Better for Results podcast with me, the human performance mechanic, and Nicholas Rolnick, my real name. Um, today, I wanted to just talk about my philosophy behind pressure, load, and repetition scheme. Um, I think it's important because we can get lost a little bit in this rigidity framework. And that rigidity framework, meaning I have to do, you know, this particular exercise for this particular amount of repetitions and this particular pressure. And I think that it goes back to, at least with resistance exercise, it goes back to what are we trying to accomplish with our prescription of blood flow restriction. And when we're talking about resistance exercise, there's a couple of different things that we can look to achieve. We can look predominantly to utilize blood flow restriction as a way to get us muscle mass and especially get us muscle mass when we are load and pain compromised, like following an injury or following surgery where we can't lift heavy. And as a result of that, we're limited to very light loads. And these loads might be as low as 10, 15% of the one rep max when they're healthy. But when we're injured and we can't lift heavy, now we're in a situation where, you know, even when we're injured, we probably can do 60, 70 reps before we get really, truly fatigued with low intensity exercise. So, and then, you know, in that, you know, framework for muscle growth, we need to get to high levels of exertion to stimulate muscle growth. But if we're not able to get to that level of exertion because it, we're, we're taking forever to reach the repetition scheme, like 40, 50, 60 reps, then it becomes pretty challenging. And that's where blood flow restriction comes in because it just shortens up that duration of repetitions that we need to hit in order to meaningfully reduce the concentric or the muscle shortening portion of the range of motion, meaningfully reduce that repetition speed, which will get us that hypertrophic stimulus. And then we just need to accumulate some volume um, in that range where contraction speed is slow enough that the actin and myosin inside of the muscle cell, the muscle fiber, uh, are able to then produce sufficient mechanical tension. Um, and so the, the, the thought with blood flow restriction was originally done in the context of we need to find a repetition scheme that has been shown to work. And that's kind of where that 30, 15, 15, 15 repetition scheme has landed was researchers kind of said, oh, it works. Um, and then they kind of replicated that. And that's great. Um, but it's still not... Um, not the best that we can do um, because it's just a framework. At the end of the day, it's just a framework, but it's a framework that at least can allow us to compare study to study um, between, which is really its its greatest asset for that repetition scheme. Unfortunately, though, um, it is a lot of repetitions and with blood flow restriction, it can be... Um, strenuous to the point of failure and 
we may or may not want to get our patients to that. And we know that when we go to failure, whether it's with or without the presence of blood flow restriction, discomfort elevates. And discomfort with blood flow restriction, as you very all well may know, is pretty moderate to high. And when we add pressure, higher amounts of pressure than we potentially need, that discomfort could be unnecessarily elevated. So the pressure load continuum is really the idea that when we have load that is of sufficient magnitude and of sufficient magnitude is about, you know, 20 to 30% of the one repetition maximum. And questions that I get asked pretty frequently are, well, I can't test the 10 RM or 5 RM with my injured patient. What can I do? And what I would tell them is just, you know, either you can do the textbook response, which is, you know, you're going to assess a contralateral 10 rep max, and you're going to assume that the limb strength is similar. And then you're going to use that as your starting point for BFR exercise, right? 20% of that contralateral 10 rep max. That's the textbook answer, right? You could do a same side rep max test, but then I would say, why, why? Um, yeah, I don't think that that's appropriate. So then you get to the non-textbook answer, which really just goes to, all right, well, we're going to pick a lightweight. We're going to start there and we're going to progress up if we can. Um, typically you can use an Omni res tool. We covered this in our on-demand course as a way to prescribe load, but basically what you do is you have them do unrestricted, you know, a couple of repetitions with, uh, with whatever load you're saying that you want them to do. And you say, all right, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being, this is the hardest you've ever worked. And one being, you could probably do this for a very, 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 very long time. What, what is that exertion level for you? And if they, you know, say anywhere between a two and a four, okay, great. That's a great starting point. Now with that, you are probably going to be underdosing them, which is totally fine, particularly in the beginning stages of BFR exercise, but you know, it's not as scientific. And that's okay. What we really should be trying to do is understand the difference between a situation where we can progress load and a situation where we can progress pressure or should progress pressure. And that was the initial formation of the pressure load continuum because the research up until that point in 2020, and it's it's now becoming even more clear as more research is being published, shows that, well, it shows a couple of things. Um, number one, um, at the end of the day, with blood flow restriction, we are simply trying to accelerate fatigue accumulation. Point blank. That is what we're doing. Pressure has been shown to be a vehicle to be able to do that at any given load. So if we add, for example, an arbitrary amount of pressure at 25% of the one rep max, right? That will accelerate fatigue accumulation more so than the same exercise performed without it. Now we want to be more specific and being more specific the research says that especially in the lower body, we're probably needing about 50% of arterial occlusion or limb occlusion pressure, which is just basically like your blood pressure, but with the cuff that you're using for exercise, right? We cover this in our, our certification, but that's the minimum pressure, right? You can go higher than that. You can go higher than 50%. You can go to 80%. And that very well might accelerate even more than 
but there's a cost and that cost is heightened perceptual demand with the exercise and what what i've noticed just from my clinical experience and teaching you know 60 plus certification courses in person and educating thousands of clinicians across the country and world is that there is a pretty strong consensus that BFR is not comfortable. So any strategies that we can use to mitigate that discomfort but get the same result is really important. And there's only certain situations where you want to think about progressing the pressure and not progressing the load. So the pressure load continuum is that way in which we can compare what is probably needed from a load and or pressure perspective at a given load and or pressure. So let, let's circle back here. So the research has, has said that as you increase load, muscle activation increases. That is a known fact. When muscle activation increases, that is thought to be more indicative of the type 2 muscle fiber recruitment. Now, the type 2 muscle fiber recruitment are the muscles, are muscle fibers that are anaerobic. And they're going to be um, producing metabolites. And those metabolites that are a byproduct of this quick ATP energy generation they kind of clog up the cross bridge cycling process. So they reduce the magnitude of the concentric or the muscle shortening phase of the contraction. They reduce the magnitude of the ability of the actin and myosin to um, cycle against each other and, and, and create that mechanical tension. They do that without sacrificing the amount of force that each cross bridge is able to produce um, when the actin and myosin slide against each other, which is really, really, really important. Um, that is why metabolic stress is a potent vehicle to get our muscle contraction velocity slow enough to get effective repetitions. So we went from load an increase in load correlating to increases in muscle activation, which is then correlated with type 2 muscle fiber recruitment, which then increases metabolic stress. Okay? So then we have pressure, right? Pressure is a vehicle to allow us to accelerate fatigue. Now, there is probably a minimum threshold Maybe about 40% in the upper body, 50% in the, in the lower body. But that pressure is simply a means to get that person to the range in which they're going to be able to stimulate reps, reps, right? Or stimulate muscle growth through stimulating repetitions. And that stimulating reps are probably larger in untrained people and get progressively smaller as we get more and more trained. But that's another moderator for the pressure load continuum, which I'll hit on it. So there is the relationship, right? We have load and we have pressure. Pressure is typically prescribed or recommended to be prescribed between 40 and 80%. And that 40% is significant because it shows that that's probably, uh, the research has shown that it's probably about 40% is where we need to get to in upper body exercise to give us the results beyond low intensity strength training. Important. Now, where do we kind of go from here? Well, if we actually take a step back and you leave load aside and you look strictly at pressure, there's a couple of things that we know about the, the, the role of pressure and its impact on perceptual factors and blood flow. If we think 
that there is a linear relationship between the amount of applied pressure and restriction in blood flow, you'd be surprised to find that there's there's not. Um, it's it's not as clear cut as you would think it to be. In fact, you know, just just going over here on the side, you know, we're looking at we've we've looked at blood flow, and we have seen that there's really a sharp drop off at about ten percent of the arterial occlusion pressure. And then it kind of stays somewhat stagnant until about 40%. And then it stays stagnant until about 90%. Right? And this is in the upper body as well. In the lower body, it might be around 80% that it starts to drop off again. But there, there is this, this idea that the blood flow reduction with increased pressure is not linear. That is really, really, really important and a fundamental piece of knowledge because then you think about the next area, which is perceptual discomfort. And we know that that's been labeled a barrier to long-term adherence to blood flow restriction. But now you say, okay, well, we know that blood flow is largely going to be similar between 40 and 80%, whether you're in the upper body or you're in the lower body, largely going to be identical. So if the blood flow is identical, blood flow reduction is identical, then the physiological stimulus is largely going to be identical, right? If you compare 40 versus 80, you probably get a little bit of a different physiologic stimulus um, in terms of muscle deoxygenation, in terms of some of the muscle activation, because when you increase pressure, you're also going to increase muscle activation. Um, and that may or may not be due to the discomfort that it's producing. I don't know. Um, but there, there's largely going to be the same reduction in blood flow. So then it goes back to, okay, well, if we know the blood, flows, blood flow restriction is about the same, whether we're using 40% or 80%, in the brachial artery, the superficial femoral artery, um, the femoral artery, right? These are where all these studies have been done. And at, an exercise, by the way, that reduction decreases as it should because our body's going to super compensate for, um, for increasing blood flow, but it's still going to be below resting levels or below like exercise if we didn't have restriction. But the relationship is still the same, right? We don't need high pressures to induce greater levels of discomfort, but get the same result. When we are thinking about the pressure load continuum, Right? I like to think about it in two, two ways, right? We have situations as a clinician where we may not know the weight of an exercise relative to their one or at max, or they might be legitimately load compromised. Like they can't increase load past a certain value. That's important. Because that's the constraints that we're working on, or we're working with, with any patient that's post-surgical, or you know, with under a physician's uh, support, we might not be able to increase load. But when we're using extremely light loads, pressure, according to the current body of evidence, needs to be higher. Right, it's inversely related to the amount of applied load. Applied pressure inversely related to the amount of load that you're using. So if we're thinking one end of the continuum is low load, right? And by low load I mean less than fifteen to twenty percent of the one rep max, right? This would qualify as low load, would mean high pressure, right? Looking at 60 to 80% of 
arterial occlusion or limb occlusion pressure would be the what would be considered optimal for pressure prescription. And that tends to be a lot of the early rehab exercises, right? You're doing short arc quads. You're doing quad sets, right? You're doing even bridging, right? Just very low grade supine type exercise where you're not really going to add a ton of load and it's going to be majority body weight or some sort of body positioning to get, um, to get you to some sort of other exercise or get you more load with, with changing, I don't know, like the staggered stance, for example, versus straight stance that you're shifting more demand onto one side, whatever. That's one end of the pressure load continuum. The other end would be, we already know when load is, is increased and we're thinking, you know, up to 50% of the one rep max, but typically with BFR, we're using, you know, no more than 30, maybe 40% of the one rep max that we know that muscle activation is already going to be elevated compared to lower loads. So the pressure doesn't necessarily need to be as high. And there's a number of reasons for that. Number one is that with greater levels of muscle activation, we are going to get greater levels of type two fiber recruitment, theoretically, right? We're assuming, but that's that that seems pretty logical to me um, and be a, and defensible. We're also, because we're having higher levels of muscle activation, right? And we know that pressure is a vehicle to accelerate fatigue. We need higher pressures when the loads are lighter. Well, when the loads are heavier, we probably don't need the same magnitude of pressure in order to fatigue, you know, meaningfully accelerate fatigue beyond, um, beyond a reasonable doubt. So those really are important and, and things that I haven't covered already too is blood flow restriction is not meant for the contraction itself. Blood flow restriction is really meant for the inter-repetition and interset rest periods such that it prevents venous return and it reduces arterial inflow. That brings nutrients in, right? And then ships out the metabolites. So when we trap those metabolites, that is what we're looking for. When people think about that, then my next assertion is going to be, okay, well, we're looking for intramuscular occlusion, right? The, the small arterioles that feed the muscle fibers. We know in multiple different muscle groups that when we're using around 20 to 25% of the one rep max, we are creating 100% natural intramuscular occlusion. When we stop the contraction, that's when the metabolites that are produced during the exercise leave. That's when, you know, we, we feel better because now we're not stimulating those afferents to, um, to communicate to our central nervous system that, hey, there's a stressful exercise occurring, etc. So that's important because if intramuscular occlusion is happening at 25, 20%, depending on the muscle group, then the pressure is merely a vehicle to prevent that blood flow return to the proximal you know, trunk. That's huge. So why would you want to do more pressure than you need to, to induce a little bit more discomfort? It, it kind of doesn't make too much sense. And that's where, um, you know, there, there was research by Solignon in 2018, 2019. What they did was they had individuals do a bilateral leg extension exercise and they matched total training volume, but they did BFR with a number of different pressure schemes, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent limb occlusion pressure. And then they compared it to high load resistance training. So everything was um was matched for um for total training volume 
right? Except the heavy loads had double the total training volume. And what were what what they found was with increasing pressure, even with the same load, discomfort tends to increase as well as exertion. So if we know that that we know these relationships, right? We know that uh, as of as of right now, when we're using very little loads, we probably should use high pressures. And when we're using moderate loads or light loads, right? Not very light, but light loads, 20 to 30% of the one rep max, right? We probably don't need high pressures. And by that, I mean anywhere from 40 to 60% of arterial or limb occlusion pressure. So then the next step is reps, All right? Well, what rep scheme do we need to do in order to ensure or at least hedge our bets that we're going to be within a the realm of stimulating muscle growth? And that's where um, my thoughts are still evolving. But currently, I'm of the notion that after you get to a short one or two session familiarization period, right, where you've now created some sort of repeated bout effect, you've conditioned the muscle to some degree, that if you're using very light loads, we're probably going to need high pressures and we're probably going to have to push our clients closer to, if not arriving at, volitional failure, right, for all the sets. Because we need to get them to experience a slowing down of the concentric portion of the muscle contraction in order to stimulate muscle growth with very light loads, right? Facts. Higher pressures and more strenuous protocols allow us to be able to do that. And then as we start to increase load, we maybe can slightly reduce the overall intensity of the exercise because we're still going to be hopefully within a um, a repetition scheme that's going to allow us to have a hypertrophic stimulus. So once you start to get to, you know, in the low end, 20% of the one rep max, you know, maybe I'm more leaning toward that traditional 30 followed by three sets of 15 for a total of 75 reps protocol. And then certainly as we get heavier and going into 30 or 40%, I am more amenable to using a lesser repetition scheme, like the ones that um, we meta-analyzed, that really three to four sets of 15 reps should be enough, at least in untrained individuals, given the load is high enough, should be enough to stimulate the same amount of muscle growth as if we were lifting head. And then we finally get to the um, the training status. And as I mentioned before, right, the training status is something that we always should consider with any sort of strength training prescription. The precision needs to be greater when we're trained and less when we're untrained. So if you take that in the context of what I just said about training uh, in terms of the pressure load continuum with the repetition scheme adopted now, layering up, layer onto that. If we're untrained, right, we might not need to push as hard all the time to get the same benefits as if we were lifting heavy, given adequate load. When we're trained, we might need to go to more intense protocols in order to stimulate equivalent muscle growth because the precision to induce muscle growth is much, much finer than if we were just starting out training at all. So that is kind of 
my thoughts on the pressure load continuum to summarize. If you have high loads, and by high loads, I mean relative to blood flow restriction. So up to, you know, 40, maybe 50% of the one rep max, then muscle activation is going to be high enough that we probably don't need high amounts of pressure, right? In load is inversely related to pressure and pressure inversely related to load. So 40% to maybe 50% is probably enough to meaningfully get you uh, into that ballpark. And with the repetition scheme adopted, really it depends on if you're trained or untrained and where you are in your program. But note that when we start to get a little bit heavier, we probably don't need as much volume as if we were load compromised and not able to progress load, then at that point, we need to progress the pressure because that pressure is going to allow us to fatigue out a little bit quicker. It's going to induce more discomfort. Absolutely. That's a unfortunate reality that we have to wrestle with when we're doing very low intensity or low load exercise with blood flow restriction, certainly less than 20% of the one rep max, we're going to need very high pressure in order to make up that difference in load. That's why if we can progress load, we want to progress load before we progress any sort of pressure. But then we also, besides progressing pressure, we can increase the volume of exercise that's being performed. Right. So we can go a little bit more closer to volitional failure, especially when we're exercising um, our clients with very light. So, what am I looking for in the future with respect to the pressure load continuum and the amount of repetitions needed at any particular loading range? Well, first, I really would love to investigate the impact of training status on resultant muscle growth given an identical repetition scheme between trained and untrained. I think that would be very interesting to look at. And I also would love to see the role of pressure in lower intensity exercise and whether or not we can use that pressure to really give us an equivalent benefit if the loads are under 20% of the one rep max. So right now the evidence suggests that 20, 30% of the one rep max, we can use BFR probably three to four sets of 15 um, if we're untrained uh, to be able to give us a, an equivalent stimulus as high intensity exercise. Well, my next question would be, all right, well, what if we have loads that are less than 20%? Can we use such high pressure with blood flow restriction to make up for that lost load? And can that then give us equal hypertrophy as if we were lifting heavy? I don't know. I mean, it would be a very interesting study to find out. But the pressure load continuum continues to evolve with more and more research. I hope that this gives you a little bit of background of the relationships between pressure and load. And if you're interested in getting certified through us, we have an on-demand certification course uh, that's on bfrtraining.com. And if you post course below, wherever you listen to your podcasts, I'll send you a message for a discount code for $100 off for our certification course. Thank you very much. And I'll see you next time. And that was today's episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, I would love if you subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. I really appreciate the support.